joining me on, on the panel tonight, Shari Marks and media editor of The Australian, Michael Cooney, executive director of the Chifley Research Centre, and in Canberra, Shane Wright, economics editor at The West Australian. And you can join us on Twitter using the hashtag the drum. Well, the federal government is resisting calls to set up a royal commission into the Commonwealth Bank and the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. A Senate inquiry has slammed ASIC's handling of rogue financial planners working at the bank who were involved in a fraud scandal which saw investors lose millions of dollars. The inquiry has recommended a royal commission, but the Prime Minister says there's already a financial systems inquiry underway. We will carefully consider the recommendations of the committee. Uh, we do obviously have an inquiry into financial governance going on now. Uh, we want to get to the bottom of these things and we want to ensure that investors are as safe as they can be. The government's very quick to call royal commissions into thing that suits, things that suit them. Uh, we'll look carefully at that recommendation. We'll look carefully at the response of ASIC and the Commonwealth Bank. ASIC Chair Greg Medcraft played down the need for a royal commission. In response to already to that inquiry, uh, we have changed the way we uh, handle um, whistleblowers uh, at ASIC. And clearly, even before this inquiry, under my chairmanship, our transparency has improved quite significantly. And the sort of type of lack of transparency that occurred then will not and does not occur now. Shane, do we need a Royal Commission? Look, uh, 553 pages of pretty damning evidence would suggest so. Look, there's a couple of key points to point out. The suggestion that this goes to the uh, financial services inquiry that we're going on. Let's be clear, it's being headed by David Murray. David Murray headed the Commonwealth Bank for 13 years. Um, I think there are more than a few people out there would say, hold on, this is a bit of a conflict going on. The inqu that inquiry is not about financial governance, no matter what the PM just said. It's a much broader thing. And what the, uh, this, this committee came up with was not specific about the Commonwealth Bank or ASIC. It, it started off as, in, sorry, as an investigation to ASIC and it's broadened. There are far, for, far more things going on. And the interesting thing that from Greg Medcraft today was that he's, he's facing a $120 million budget cut and he said, I've got 30 blokes or 30 people to uh, keep track of 40,000 financial advisors. And in the case of the Commonwealth Bank's investment arm and ASIC, they couldn't do it then. And there's no real confidence that they'll be able to do it anytime soon. Michael, do we need a Royal Commission? ASIC is arguing it's, it's a lot of money to spend and perhaps that money might be better spent uh, monitoring these kind of uh, financial uh, players. Well, the cuts to ASIC are clearly a big risk now, aren't they? But I think we've benefited in Australia from a very stable financial system and we haven't had the problems you've seen overseas, especially in 2009, 2008. And this, I think, puts in question a lot of agendas which have been building up in the government. The, it's ironic to hear the Prime Minister say, oh, well, let's let the financial services inquiry take care of it. The financial services inquiry looks like something designed to make it easier to get the leash off the banks and get the leash off financial advisors. Same with the changes they want to make to uh, the future of financial advice, making it harder for people to be confident in financial advice and easing the rules. So uh, this, I think, is a really strong warning sign that that, that agenda is just not where we should be going. What do you think, Sherry? Need a Royal Commission? Look, I don't know if we need a Royal Commission, which does cost millions and millions of dollars, but I think the parliamentary inquiry clearly recommended that this is likely to go beyond the Commonwealth Bank, that the industry as a whole needs to be examined. So it does need to be looked at, whether it's through another parliamentary inquiry uh, or a Royal Commission, that's up to you know, others to decide. But I did think it was really interesting listening to the uh, ASIC whistleblower on ABC Radio this morning. I think his name was James Wielden. And he uh, worked at ASIC and he made it quite clear that it, the organisation at the moment, he thought it was incompetent, lazy, it wasn't taking a lot of these issues seriously. They, you know, it took them over a year before they even began to look into the current allegations. So there are a lot of other issues here. I don't think Matthias Corman sounded too proactive about it this morning. He reluctantly said he was going to meet with the Commonwealth Bank management in coming weeks, but he really sort of had to be pushed. He, he wasn't uh, very strong or taking the front foot on this issue, that's for sure. Well, Shane, Matthias Corman's also about to try and uh, repeal Labor's laws into um, the future of financial advice. Where, where does this decision by the Senate committee put those laws? Well, it, it, the interesting thing is he, um, Senator, Mc, uh, Senator Cormann, is about to regulate 
huge changes in in those financial regulations and the whole argument that he's been running is we're going to save business 190 million dollars a year getting red red of red tape the opponents and these are it's a it's a very strange group of consumer groups some financial planners are worried about it you've got industry super you've got seniors organizations really petrified about where they're going they're saying it's going to cost us half a billion dollars a year. So at the I don't know if you could pick a worse time in which to say you've got this one report saying ASIC's in all sorts of trouble. They're supposed to be policing financial advisors. Oh, by the way, why don't we just change, uh, water down some of the regulations governing those financial advisors who just happen to be under the auspices of the four big banks and AMP? It is, it is really bad timing. It sounds and smells like a, a, an absolute political tin ear, which we got used to Julia Gillard and the previous Labor government in terms of policy tin ears. This one is uh, the, the government's, uh, the current government's tin ear. Well, it has been a big week in federal politics, the week when Clive Palmer confirmed he would help kill off the carbon tax. The re repeal bills passed in the House of Representatives last night with a group hug. And there were plenty of high fives as well. Prime Minister Tony Abbott says he's optimistic that the repeal bills will be passed in the new Senate. The government's taking nothing for granted, but obviously we're encouraged by the discussions that we had with Mr Palmer over the last few days. Uh, this will be an unambiguous good for our country. No matter what deal Tony Abbott manages to cobble together with Clive Palmer, Australians will be worse off as a result of this week in Parliament. Shari, what did you make of events this week? Oh, it was a, a complete farce. The Australian newspaper has an excellent editorial today, a, a full-length editorial on the issue, and if anyone hasn't rec read it yet, I highly recommend it. But it just shows how, um, you know, I, I'm sorry to say this on the ABC, but how many on the ABC and at Fairfax have been um, so supportive of Palmer's move this week, and they've bought into the fact that he stood up there with Al Gore. They think he's turned over a new leaf and suddenly he's, you know, seeing the environmental light, when in in fact, all he did, he is the bloke who killed off the carbon tax. Well, and I so think for that the has next been reported that way decade, quite, a, quite across the board, hasn't it, oh, that he's killed well, off the carbon tax? Well, not initially, I think. I just uh, said it then. Well, you <laughs> said it then, but the initial reports um, on, on the ABC and on Fairfax, uh, not by everyone, of course, but the main reports, said that, no, that, that Tony Abbott's plans were now in disarray because of Palmer's announcement, and, and that's just incorrect. Um, I think that what it means is that we don't have any sort of carbon pricing mechanism for at least the next decade or until the rest of the world gets into line, which may never, ever happen. Michael, how did you see those events this week? Oh, it's, uh, remember, we we're going to get grown-up government and stability and order and certainty. It's not that, is it? It was just... Why, why isn't it that? Well, I think what you've seen is basically that the Prime Minister's reaping the whirlwind. You know, the Prime Minister ran on a, on a really... Uh, irresponsible and negative campaign against carbon pricing. But this is uh, this is this is what he promised, wasn't it? Well, this is the point. What he promised was this chaos. Precisely, like basically, he's the he's the he's now the dog who caught the car. Like now he's got to actually do this thing, and he knows it doesn't make sense. Everyone knows it doesn't make sense. Direct action is a complete donkey of a policy, and carbon pricing is working. And now he's got to unstitch it. And uh, in a way, what you see with Palmer is that that growing realization even among business. You know, for a long period. The, a handful of electricity intensive exporters and a handful of miners really sat on the rest of the business community who really knew that this is the right way to go. And now what they're discovering is that the last thing they'll get is certainty. The last thing they'll get is certainty and it's a disaster. Uh, Shane, there was jubilation in the House of Reps from, from the Coalition. Will there be jubilation in the West because the, the carbon tax was certainly unpopular there? Oh, look, I just want to say to Shari, the West Australian accurately reported this whole thing as well. It wasn't just the, the odds that got it right in terms of trying to work out what happened. Two newspapers then. <laughs> well, look, there's, there's someone that's got to rise above the ruck, don't, don't they? I think there's a, the, the Nobel Committee uh, back in Sweden is going to be wondering what the hell's gone on with Al Gore. Look, they might be asking for their, their laureate back uh, just because that was absolutely weird. Uh, as anyone so, who saw it transpire. In the West, and Michael's right, the, the uh, mining sector has been going hammer and tongs at this. And what, like in, t in terms of parallel universes, we've got Greg Hunt, who advocated eff effectively a price on carbon as his university thesis. We've got Tony Abbott saying the world's moving against carbon pricing when he's 
two weeks ago, the World Bank puts out a report showing how all these other countries are moving towards a price on carbon. In terms of a mess of a situation, we go to give us two weeks, there won't be direct action in place, there won't be a price on carbon. You're going to reduce the price of electricity, which is the biggest emitter, the electricity sector is the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. Last time I checked a supply and demand curve, you reduce the price of something, demand goes up. So if you see an increase in greenhouse gas emissions from electricity, you know who you're going to have to blame, and that's the government with its policy decisions. Sherry, well, you want to jump in there? Yeah, unless, of course, uh, Greens change their mind and decide to vote for... Uh, Tony Abbott's direct action plan, um, you know, deciding to keep some sort of scheme in place, whether it's better Is than... Is that likely to happen, Michael? Could happen. The Greens have voted against an ETS twice in the past. There's only one party in the Parliament that's never voted against an emissions trading scheme, and that's the Australian Labor Party. So but you could rule nothing out on the Greens at this point. They've backflipped on the petrol price. But it'd be an embarrassment if they kill off a scheme for the third time, wouldn't it? Not the first time they've been embarrassed, though. Okay. And, they've managed, and they've managed to kill off a couple of Prime Ministers and uh, Malcolm Turnbull. Like... All for, for achieving what is one of the great questions that's being asked inside certain elements of the Greens at the moment. OK, well, this week does mark the one-year anniversary since Kevin Rudd rolled at Julia Gillard. And head to the Drum website and read a piece from Ms Gillard's former advisor, Darren Barnett, on the art of the political square-up. Well, there are reports today that Australia's largest coal miner, Glencore, paid almost no tax over the past three years, despite generating an income of $15 billion. An investigation by Michael West from Fairfax has found the company reduced its tax bill by taking massive loans from its overseas associates. In a statement to the drama, spokesperson for Glencore disputed the findings in the story, saying we have paid about $3.4 billion in taxes and royalties over the past three years. Now, um, Shane, Glencore wouldn't give us a breakdown between royalties and taxes. That matters, doesn't it? It, it absolutely matters because royalties are... You buy, you're buying... Uh, the coal. The coal's owned in Glencore's case, or extra formerly Extrata, it's owned principally by the people of Queensland. It's like Shari and myself, our newspaper, saying, oh, look, the, uh, we're buying newsprint, but that's such a tax on us. It's not. You're buying something that's owned by somebody else. So there is a reason they didn't tell you how much they've paid tax slash royalties. And ultimately, royalties, because it's a cost to production, reduces your overall, uh, reduces your overall tax bill. So this whole argument over taxes and royalties, one often run by miners, you've got to take into account that royalties are not a tax, they're so a payment. So Shane, how does a company that makes $15 billion pay virtually no tax? Well, they've just got smarter accountants than you and I, that's for sure. Um, and it's the way, and I think Michael West's piece actually goes into some depth about, say, uh, the use of interest being paid between subsidiaries of the company because interest is a tax deduction as well, so that reduces your overall tax burden. There's an accusation of transfer pricing as well in terms of, and this is a, a long-running campaign about uh, multinationals being able to push up the price of a good in one country, forcing the cost back, uh, to the original supplier and moving it around just to avoid taxes. And uh, I think the World Bank, the OECD, the IMF, the G20, any organisation with an acronym has been pointing out the problems that are going on in terms of multinationals moving around income to avoid paying tax. Michael, what does it matter if they're creating jobs, creating wealth and complying with the law? Look, corporate tax is more important than ever before as part of the tax base of the country. And we're being told by the Conservatives that there's a, a crisis of cost on the budget, that we have to cut pensions, that we have to put up petrol tax, that we have to charge for GPs because of rising costs. There's a revenue problem here. And it's choices that governments make and choices that businesses make not to tax and not to pay tax that are putting pressure on social services and on investments in future prosperity. So, Shari, do companies like this need to do more lifting? Yeah, I actually agree with what Michael said. I think we've got, you know, a debt levy will most likely come into place in the petrol excise. And really, you've got these major companies turning over billions and billions and they're just, you know, shifting um, their, their headquarters in a in an intellectual sense to places like Ireland or the Netherlands where there's a lower tax rate and uh, this is a major issue and it, it will be dealt with this year by the OECD and by the G20 so we'll see what happens. But we need to see leadership from the Prime Minister though. He went overseas and said no one ever taxes themselves towards prosperity. Like historically untrue but also deeply unhelpful in this precise context where what we need is international cooperation between countries to ensure the tax is paid. Not our Prime Minister who's going to have a major platform at the G20 going and lecturing countries about getting companies to pay less.
I, I think to uh, think that uh, the G20 is going to solve it is uh, just hope over reality because ultimately countries will say what's in my self-interest and that may be to have a lower tax rate. There's the other problem though also for if you're a domestically based company, if a, a multinational is reducing their overall tax bill that puts more pro, uh, tax pressure on them to foot the bill that's left and so I think the small business and medium-sized and large domestic businesses, they should be also kicking up a stink about what's going on. But uh, that's not in the... Uh, not, not, uh, that's very unlikely at this stage. Well, Glencore's CEO has made it to number five on this year's annual BRW Rich List, which was published today. 57-year-old Ivan Glassenberg is worth $6.63 billion. Mike Clay has taken a look, a closer look at, why other, at the other wealthy Australians who made the cut. Life's pretty good for the top end of town, with the total net worth of our top 200 reaching $193 billion. The average wealth on the list is $968 million this year, which means that uh, the 200 are almost worth a billion dollars each. And again, the best things in life are free. The top five in this year's BRW Rich List reads like a who's who of business dynasties. Gina Reinhardt's massive fortune puts her solidly in front. No surprise, Gina Reinhardt's always number one these days, $20.01 billion. She's got a little bit poorer, but she's still extremely rich. It's a close race to play second fiddle, with Anthony Junior Pratt just edging out James Junior Packer. Well, both of those guys have actually uh, doubled their wealth in the last few years, so it shows you sort of, uh, I guess, the young guns are uh, doing pretty well for themselves. Pratt may be richer, but my money's on Packer in an all out street fight. Westfield owner and Socceroos tragic Frank Lowy sits on a tidy seven billion, while pulling up the rear is South African-born Ivan Glassenberg, whose wealth is tied to the meteoric rise of Glencore Extrata. I think the global financial crisis is well and truly over for the, uh, the wealthy elite, the very top end of town. They're still they're doing better than they have before. On the other hand, Clive Palmer's wealth has shrunk by almost half. He's almost not a billionaire anymore, just another wealthy politician. <laughs> if you ask Big Clive uh, how rich he is, he always believes he's worth more than what we say. Palmer makes his money from mining royalties, but he's fighting with the Chinese company that pays him. I think Clive's concentrating a little bit more on his politics and his business these days, but uh, having said that, uh, he's also concentrating a lot on his legal battles when it comes to his business. But being rich in Australia is still a pretty male affair. Just 14 of the top 200 are women. And a high-profile lefty is also MIA. What if founder Graham Wood has failed to make the $250 million cutoff? Most of the people on the list do want to be on it. They, they are very competitive and they love to see where they end up. Graham Wood's a bit of an exception. Uh, he said to us that uh, he had two goals in life. One was to get off the rich list and the other one was to uh, make a bit of a difference out there. Socialist? He should take a leaf out of Gina's playbook. <laughs> Shane, what did we learn from the BRW Rich List this year? Uh, that the tax office has a, a, a new document to work off and uh, <laughs> who's it going to target. Mm -hmm. And I'm not kidding, they, they, will, they do read the uh, BRW Rich List to see who's moving and who, especially who's climbing fairly quickly. Um, it's uh, just something to keep a track of in, in their terms of their high wealth uh, net worth uh, individuals. The other thing that you see through that list is just how many people make money buying and selling property. Like Gina Reinhardt, for instance, she, she is a, like a lot of people don't see it, but she's a self-made woman who's done extraordinarily well. Her Roy Hill uh, iron ore project, for instance, 10 bill, the way that she's pulled that together is, is actually something that people should be giving her applause, not just for, not because of her politics, because of her business acumen. But you go through it and there's a lot of people who make a lot of money just buying and selling pieces of Australia. It's, uh, it, from an economic point of view, it's not the most uh, uh, enlightening or happy making uh, percent, uh, percentage of people. Michael, anything stand out for you? Oh, Self-made's generous. She's, she's worked hard. but She has uh, worked hard. But three, three of the top four are heirs, aren't they? I, I thought it was interesting to see the report that um, Gina Reinhardt's wealth has gone down because the iron ore price has gone down. When it was going up, it was going up because she worked hard and was a business genius, right? Um, so, so it's good to know the economic rents are, are operating on the downside for them.
Shari, what stood out for you on that list? Well, I was just going to respond to that. I mean, they are as and there was family money, but you know, each of them in the top uh, four or five have completely changed the company. I mean, Packers moved from media to uh, gaming. He's now a gaming mogul, and Gina's done. You know whether you agree with her or not she's done remarkable work to build the family fortune so but um, other things that stood out I think Palmer is still a billionaire and we can't forget that and it's a good reminder for everyone in the press gallery that he does have vested interests and he isn't out there to you know come up with some new environmentally friendly scheme he's he's trying not to pay his carbon tax bill he's worth over a billion dollars from coal all right well FIFA has shown its bark on that bite Football's governing body has slapped a four-month ban on Uruguay striker Luis Suarez for biting an opponent at the World Cup in Brazil. The player Luis Suarez is banned from taking part in any kind of football-related activity, administrative, sport or any other, for a period of four months in accordance with Article 22 of the FIFA Disciplinary Code. The ban means that Suarez will miss Uruguay's next nine international games and the start of the upcoming Premier League season. ABC Grandstand's Ned Hall joins us now. Uh, Ned, right decision by FIFA? I think so. I mean, they could have gone as long as two years in terms of the total ban that they handed out to him. Uh, and I think the ban, if it went beyond international football, really hits Liverpool, who he wasn't playing for at the tournament, and it rules him out of the rest of the World Cup and, and an awful lot more of Uruguay's future international games. So I think the, it's about right in terms of the balance. I could see a possible alternative. They could have got Cellini to surgically withdraw Suarez's teeth in a pre-game entertainment <laughs> ritual, perhaps, before Uruguay's next, ga next game. That, and le uh, let uh, Suarez play afterwards. He should probably play in some sort of retainer or gun shield from <laughs> now on. That might <laughs> cut down the odds. The third time he's been found guilty of biting, uh, which is, is incredible. I mean, for, for a player to have done it once in his career, they're usually tainted with, with that tag as a biter. This is three times through his career now, and I think 34 games he's been banned for, for instance, which he's never seen a red card for as well, because there was a racist comment as well. So, so if you think three times biting and four months, you could say that's lenient. Yet Uruguay is set to appeal. What, what happens next with the appeal process? I don't know that the appeal will hold a lot of weight because they won't be able to appeal and have that appeal heard, I don't think, in time for their next game. I think they're, they're now they're going to have to play the game without him. He's gone back to Uruguay as well as Suarez already, I think, and okay. been received with a hero's welcome at Montevideo Airport. So, yeah. Michael, he is a footballing superstar. Is, that a, is it a fair ban? It's, it's going to certainly punish Uruguay? As long as he's already knocked out England. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should. I want to see him find that. You know that Italian guy who took the dive in 2006? You should go and bite that guy. <laughs> that guy he's got the wrong touch. It's a tragedy. Shane, was this the right call by FIFA, an organisation that doesn't normally get calls right? Uh, it would be the first time in a long while that FIFA's got a call right. I, I think the most interesting thing I just, I've seen is that uh, you're three times more likely to be bitten by Suarez than by a great white shark. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that tells you how dangerous he is. Uh, don't worry about netting beaches, just don't get onto a football pitch with Suarez. Shari, did you think it was fair to wipe him out of the World Cup? Um, look, he, he bit another player, he's done it before, he's a repeat offender, it's not like it's a first time offence, so yes it's a tough penalty but why shouldn't it be? And, and so he bit the guy in the shoulder yeah. and then I saw the picture before, he was holding his teeth. When yeah, he's... pretending that his shoulder <laughs> he's, collided yeah. with his teeth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do they not have childcare in Uruguay? <laughs> <laughs> like it's, like, this is something you learn before you're four, isn't it? I know, it? it's outrageous. Like, home. Ned, um, there was a very interesting thing went on in one of the games today. Uh, Russia and Nigeria this mm. morning. Oh, a, yeah. a laser was shone into the light of the Russian goalie's face just before a goal was scored. Tell us what happened yeah, there. A crucial time of the match as well and a pivotal moment. It, I mean, it's basically knocked Russia out of the tournament. They ended up in a one-all draw against Algeria. Um, We're seeing the footage there was, and he's protesting. Look at that. You, you know, it's, it's clearly the laser is you know, shining all over him, all over his body and in, just in his face. And then that's the goal that basically secured Algeria before. the draw that gets them through to the knockout stage. If Russia had won 1-0, they'd have gone through to the next stage. It, it's a worry for, for more than one reason. That there's not really much recourse for, for Algeria or FIFA to, to penalise anybody as a result of that. And you do worry about copycat incidents with this because clearly... Yeah fans will realise they've got a bit of an and advantage. And it's a shame we've had these two incidents, that, that laser mm. incident and the biting, because it's been a fantastic World Cup so far, hasn't it? Uh, one of the best in, in recent times. The style of football, it's been open, it's been attacking, there's been a lot of goals, teams haven't sat back. It's been really entertaining and yet you have these two incidents right at the end of the group stage, which has taken a bit of, a bit of gloss in some senses off the football that we've seen. Um, I think once you get back to the knockout stages, the, the focus will return to the football, as long as we don't see too many more lasers or bites. Now we now know 
know who's going to be in the, the last 16, don't we? What are the, the, the key games to look forward to, Ned? It's interesting that the first couple of games, terrible, there's a night of football tonight, incidentally, after two weeks. How solid. are you going to cope? I don't know, to be honest. I don't <laughs> watch, watch something else or maybe sleep, but yeah. might be the other option. The, the two games that really stand out for me, Brazil against Chile, um, as the you know, two South American sides, and even without Suarez, I think Colombia against Uruguay will be a really big game as well, and, and to see which of those South American sides advance, because from that you're going to see one of the sides go through to the finals. So whoever comes out of that little group will be, uh, yeah, going to be playing a big role in the lighter stage of the tournament. And what about on the other sides of the draw? What's who's likely to get be working their way through at the moment? Look, Argentina uh, and, and Germany um, are both looking reasonably good at the moment. Argentina, I think, for, for when I worked out my predictor pre-tournament, I had Argentina and Brazil getting through to the final, and, and I don't think there's there's too much to sort of uh, uh, convince me otherwise at the moment. The Argentinians do look very good. One of the interesting things to come out of this World Cup to Ned is how it's being watched in the US. Mm. Uh, it's really taken off there, hasn't it? Absolute record numbers over there. I think 18, 20 million viewers for some of their games are through to the last 16 for the second tournament in a row. Mm. I think they're also saying there's more US fans in Brazil than any other nation as well. Right. People have really got behind the game. The MLS has become a, a big thing now in America. It is behind the other major sporting codes, but, but it's starting to gain traction now, which FIFA will be absolutely delighted about because it's a market they've never really cracked. But there's signs now that people are starting to take notice a lot more. So could the US become a, a, a soccer a powerhouse because certainly the younger players are playing and the demographics are shifting there a little bit in the US? Well, I think young players have always played uh, a lot of you know, football, you know, soccer at, at junior levels. It had just been never translated to the senior levels. It had been a, a good youth game in America for a long, long time, but people are sticking with the game for that little bit longer now. I think as some of the sports have a, a few more issues around them and, and people think it's actually a career path now. All right, Ned, I'm sure we can all uh, listen in on Grandstand on the weekend and uh, get the latest results on the World Cup. Absolutely. A World Cup and everything else as well. All right. Thanks very much for coming on. And that is all for the drum for tonight and for the week. Thanks so much to our panel tonight. Sherry Markson from The Australian, Michael Cooney from the Chifley Institute and Shane Wright from the West Oz. You can check out the website at abc.net.au slash the drum and I'll see you again on Monday. Have a great weekend.